Sure. All right, welcome back, shooters. Thanks for tuning in for tonight's episode of Shooting Straight, Handball Podcast with JD and Joey. Uh, tonight, we're uh, pleased to join, be joined by the the only person with all the handball news in America. It's <laughs> John Ryan from Team Handball News himself. John, how are you doing this evening? I'm doing great. Thanks for uh, having me on. Awesome, awesome, Joey. As always, what are you? Uh, how are you doing this, this, this tonight? To la, 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 tonight? <laughs> I'm, I'm fantastic. I got and you. Even stuttering. better now that I get to talk to my good friend John Ryan. Excellent, excellent. Uh, for those that are new to the show, as always, we got uh, scrolling text for the topics for tonight. So um, should be pretty uh, straightforward. We had uh, a conversation with John after our last episode about the uh, form club handball, and he had some. Some things he wanted to clear up with everybody. So uh, tonight we're going to be going over some of the details surrounding that. And uh, you know, if you got any questions, feel free to put put them in the Twitch, and we'll uh, we'll try to answer it as best we can. So cool. So Joey, what uh, what questions you got for John here? John, for for the two people who don't know who you are, just just tell tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, what you do. Uh, you know, I've been, been involved with uh, handball in the U.S. since uh, mid-1980s. Uh, I played on the Condors in California to, after after learning the game at Air Force. And then uh, I was briefly on the national team for a couple of years, went to the 93 World Championships, um, helped start uh, well, the D.C. Diplomats, uh, still going strong, and then uh, also the Las Vegas Scorpions. Uh, they're, they right, joined the graveyard, I think. Yep. Maybe <laughs> maybe they can rise out like uh, some Phoenix. zombies, but uh, we'll see. <laughs> the and then I, uh, that'd be badass. Yeah, don't <laughs> yeah. mess with a zombie scorpion. That would be a cool. That'd be a cool club name. Somebody yeah. should. Uh, Pretty should nice logo that. opportunities there too. Um, yeah, uh, and then. Uh, I lived in France for five years. I had a hardship uh, assignment while I was in the Air Force to work at a small NATO office there. And so I really became uh, immersed in handball in Europe while I was living there and I ended up starting the Team Handball News website and uh, and uh, been following handball very closely ever since then. That's Sweet. putting it lightly what? there. John is yeah. the uh, all-knowing power of handball in the western hemisphere all knowing with very little power <laughs> john's the man behind the curtain for yeah. those of you who are one of us fans for sure but uh why did you start team handball news what what prompted that you know it, it was funny uh especially back in uh you know i had a blog actually i think i did my first blog post during the 2004 olympics um, blog spot those posts are are still up there okay and uh we noticed there really wasn't much english language content and i say we uh bjorn brems who uh also played with the condors and also if houston he lives in germany he's uh helps me out i've taken over some of the webmaster duties but uh, he helped get it set up and then uh, bogdan passat who is kind of gone off the handball map a little bit uh, we we started the site, and I think the biggest instigator was a lot of the issues going on with the decertification back in that time frame. There's there's even some podcasts going back. I interviewed uh, I interviewed Matt Van Houten and Mike Mike Hurdle talking about the disputes on the uh, USA Team Handball Board back then before decertification, and then um, there's actually the NGB hearings to decide uh there was two competing bids to become the new federation and uh the audio is not real good but uh there's audio of uh them taking questions from the usoc 
way back then. And, you know, since then, it was just something to, to keep, uh, keep people informed. Um, started as a U.S. thing, and then we started doing – Christopher All joined uh, once he was done with uh, the referee committees with the IHF. So we would cover a lot of international stuff as well. Um, so kind of a hodgepodge. Um, you know, it's kind of morphed into um, more of a focus on trying to think about different ways USA Team Handball can do things better. That's kind of where I've taken it lately. But, you know, if there's a competition and the U.S. is playing, I'm going to try and cover it when, when that's happening. And I've also taken uh, a big interest in college handball. So I've tried to beef that up. And uh, with the help of Brian Cothorn, we've got like a top five uh, poll. And I think that's a nice way to kind of uh, uh, give a little more emphasis to the college game because I, I really like the college game, and I think that's where the focus should be. Good answer. Sweet. Good answer. Yeah, the uh, Bogdan comments, I uh, I forget which post it was you had a couple of weeks ago that I, I started reading through, and it was like 30 comments deep on some rant, and I was like, whoa, yeah. this is getting heated. <laughs> and it, it was, it was a, I think, late, early early 2000s, so it, it might have been around yeah. that time. He he was part of one of the competing bids, oh, that one right. of the, the, the competing bid that lost to uh, Dieter Esch and company. Gotcha. And so there was a lot of... Uh, uh, there was a little bit of friendship and, you know, let's move forward, but it kind of, kind of deteriorated to some real animosity. They even started a s- competing federation for a little bit Oh, geez. Uh, at go? the same time. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, that was kind of strange. There was two federations, but they weren't recognized by the USOC. So it didn't really go anywhere. They did have the, uh, uh, the Miami tournament with uh, the, the four French clubs that came over back in 2009. So that was a big thing they were doing. Um, but there was, there was some bad blood between the, uh, the uh, two competing bids. So the competing organization is the one that organized the, the French league final four. Yes. Oh. They, uh, they organized that. And I have no idea how, how it all, played out exactly you know bogdan was was a part of that bid so he kind of had uh you know everybody in handball has a little bit of an agenda so he kind of had an agenda along those lines and then mariush uh i I can't pronounce the name he was part of the competing bid too but then he got hired yeah Uh, he's the the technical technical director director. so that's right yeah yeah so there was a little bit of like hey you know (laughs) you you left us so there was a little bit of uh, uh, controversy with that as well. The handball wars. Yeah, seriously. Already? Holy cow. I've got like a million questions just based on the first 10 seconds. Of- <laughs> <laughs> like everything from the decertification through that um, wonderful, wonderful event in Miami. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I, I bet we could go on for hours there. Uh, just talking about what what you just uh, what you just mentioned, but, I, but I oh, those are some what, go ahead. crazy times, I'll tell you. Oh, I yeah. believe it, it seems to be the yeah. for, for handball in the United States of America. Just crazy times. It's a right roller coaster, man. Just hop on. Who knows where it's going to go? You know, you know all those articles, all those commentaries, all those podcasts. If you really want to just delve start, into it, yeah, you got them all. Just, just head on back to. You know, back to 2006, 2007. That's the only thing they're all I think still there. with your website. I wish there was like a last button. I feel like, uh, I think maybe I, <laughs> I mean, when I last time I navigated, I was like trying to go back pretty far and I was like, I keep hitting, you know, next, next, next. Yeah. So, well, I'll, I'll see what I can do. You okay. know, the other thing you can do is the search tool works okay. pretty good. Okay. All if right. you plug in different, you know, keywords and uh, you know certain topics decertification you probably would get a lot of pro- things, uh, <laughs> for those um, of you that don't know that uh, john has his uh i think it's just team handball is that is that right yep okay yep. so if everybody go check out team handball news.com this is not a paid advertisement for team handball news.com but, uh, but it should be john we're gonna be venmo <laughs> requesting that <laughs> so 
Joey, I don't have a problem if you want to start laying into some of those questions. I, I'm all on board with that. At least Let's a couple. Ask of the them. big one here. Yeah. Okay. Right out of the gate, because I know this will well, this will take us down many a rabbit hole. So why why not just open with this one? John Ryan, why does the United States of America suck at handball? Why are we so bad? Oh, it, you know that would be that would be a ten part series of podcasts. It would be <laughs> it'd be like uh, it'd be like those men in blazers thing they did on the the on the, the soccer team that you you sent me the link the other day. American fiasco. A fiasco, yeah. You know, it, there's a lot of reasons. You know, it's not one mm-hmm. simple reason. You know, there's a lack of resources. If we had more resources, certainly you could do a lot of things that other federations do that we simply can't because there's just not enough resources to hire people and to support clubs and to sustain clubs. Um, so I think, you know, take a very Cliff Notes version because there's so few resources, the focus has always been on our national teams and putting together the best national team we can for whatever tournament or event was upcoming. You know, 84, 96, very much focused on trying to get those Olympic teams uh, to play as well as they could. Also back then, the competition was much easier in this, uh, in this uh, North South America region, which, made it more feasible to take some great athletes, train them up for two, three years and to have a really good team. Plus handball in Europe wasn't nearly as professionalized. I mean, there was people that were getting paid, but the vast majority of the people weren't getting paid. So um, you were, you had less competition both in our hemisphere and then over in Europe. So you could put together a bunch of really good athletes and, scare the hell out of you know west germany at the 1984 olympics it was very feasible back then um and then as the money dried up we couldn't even do you know you want to you want to do grassroots and you want to do national teams we kind of had enough money there for a while to do national teams then the money just totally disappeared we couldn't do either um and Without more resources, it's hard to do things. Where does that money come from? Traditionally, it came from the U.S. Olympic Committee. Um, Europeans weren't very focused on helping us. Um, I think they were very uh, insular looking inside at Europe. We're starting to see that change a little bit, which is which is great. Um, um, and, and maybe we'll get on TV. I, I think that's like the the one thing that uh, could really be a catalyst to change a lot of things. But you know what? There's a link where um, back in 2012, I wrote like a seven, eight part series, you know, why aren't, why aren't the U S teams in London? And there's been a few things that have changed since then, but it kind of covers that issue in in pretty good detail. Um, Answers that question, I think. As, as well as can be done <laughs> in a seven part. To... Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Thank you, John. That was actually, that was a, that was a great answer. But the one thing I'm going to challenge you on is essentially like across the board, people point to a lack of resources as the reason, right? And it makes sense because there's no money. Like there's, I shouldn't say there's no money, but there's not a lot of opportunities to, to create a financially viable organization within the sport in the U S but I, I think that's more of a, a, an effect as opposed to a, a cause. Does that make sense? I feel like there's something deeper, like within the psyche of, of the sport and, and just people in America in the sense that like, you know, even in the nineties, people knew what rugby was. People knew what lacrosse was. They might not have played it, but you would, you can watch American pie. You see lacrosse, you watch Tommy boy, you see rugby. Even today you can walk down the street and ask a hundred people what they thought of handball. 99 would have no idea what you're talking about. One of them would say, Oh yeah, no, I play that and racquetball too. Right. So like to, to like push back to challenge you, I guess a little bit, like it goes beyond the resources there's there's just something fundamental about how the sport has not taken roots in the u.s 
Sure. And, and it, it seems kind of silly, but, you know, nomenclature, the name, that that's always been an issue to one extent or another when you have to spend time uh, explaining that you're the other handball that's that's a handicap. You know, that doesn't help anything. It's something that you can overcome, but it's a it's a hindrance. Um, I think also that the similarity in terms of the flow of play, in terms of being an indoors court sport, I think basketball and handball have a lot of similarity. And you're not going to see a whole lot of countries where both sports are super popular. There's some exceptions, but because basketball is our game and it features a lot of the same types of athletes in an indoor court, that's a huge competition that's got such a strong foothold that you, you have to eat into that a little bit. I think that that, that hurts us. Um, I've always wondered, you know, if, you know, you go, you go back in the time machine and uh, James Naismith is, uh, you know, in Springfield is going to start basketball up and you just say, not going to happen today. You know, maybe, you know, maybe you don't have to kill him. Maybe you, you make him <laughs> sick or something or, you know, or you, Doesn't you have plan a year for him to look at something like handball. Yeah. But so, sooner or later, some sort of indoor court sport would have taken hold. You know, um, and I bet you handball, if, if, it, if they never thought of something in the U.S., I bet you it would have made its way over to the U.S. and it become popular. That's pure speculation. And, and I know a lot of people get upset when you say like, handball and basketball, they're different sports. Don't try and, you know, over compare them, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But I think that that is a, is a major factor as well. Interesting. Uh, that's 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 more of the that's more of the answer I think uh, yeah I, I like that I like that answer John and this kind of leads me down a path that I've been thinking a lot recently with the amount the MLB has been in the news and re- reflecting on the the landscape of sport in the U S because the average fan of the MLB is over fifty years old and while it's not football while kids are you know might still be playing baseball like not they're not leaving baseball from the same concerns as they're leaving football, which is safety. They're just leaving it because it's boring. Mm-hmm. Less and less yeah. kids are playing it. More kids are going to lacrosse. So this begs the question, like you said, you know, it's tough to compete with basketball. That's a losing proposition. Even with football's problems, it's tough to compete, compete with that. Do you think there's an opportunity if we transition the focus more towards competing with baseball, whether that be moving the season to the spring, making it more of an outdoor game, there's an opportunity there? Um, I'll do a little tangent on baseball because I was reflecting on that with my brother a while back. You know, I played t- t- 10 years of organized baseball. I was, a, I was a pretty decent player. I wasn't a superstar or anything. High school record setter, John. Yeah. Hey, fielding <laughs> percentage. <laughs> we, I, I, I forgot about the, uh, I had to explain that, you know, I didn't brag about my, my hitting skills. No, no home runs in my uh, baseball Golden, career. Golden gloves are still <laughs> not for a first baseman. <laughs> but I was, I was totally enamored with baseball as a child. My uncle got me a subscription of Sporting News. I'd run out to the mailbox hoping it was there. I can right now. I'm smelling what the Sporting News newsprint was like, and I'd read every article in the National League East. I was a big Pittsburgh Pirate fan. I still know the starting lineup when I was a kid. How are you a Pirates now, fan? I, 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 you know, now my my grandpa was a Cubs fan. Okay. And I just like the name, the Pittsburgh okay. Pirates. Cubs games were the only thing on TV. Yeah, WGN. in Iowa, I figured. Yeah. Well, you know, Iowa actually is, is kind of interesting because wh- and where I grew up was basically five hours from Minnesota, Milwaukee, both Chicago, oh. St. Louis, and Kansas City. So you were, we were like – nowhere close essentially to located yeah pick, pick a team i guess <laughs> um but but my point is is i don't watch any baseball i i didn't watch any of the playoffs it's i like going to a game every once in a while mm-hmm. but beer hot dog and, and i certainly enjoyed playing it it's like 
stick a fork in baseball. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I yep. mean, Amen. it's just a matter of time. I, I, I'm sorry if I'm offending any big baseball fans out there. We don't have but... any in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> it's past their bedtime. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, and, that, and that's what somebody, some folks have talked about. I mean, uh, you know, there's been some talk about the pro league concept, you know, way back, I think Dennis Burkholz and some folks were talking about a summer league, you know, a short summer season where you would have a mixture of American and international players play like a short summer season. Mm -hmm. um, and, you, and you would, you wouldn't, you would have the less competition. Of course, other folks are doing that. You got the three on three league, the, the basketball tournament arena football was there for a while. A lot of people saw that as a possible Season. opening, yeah. if you will. And, and the reality is basketball goes to June, you know, yeah. so it's, it's still around then as well. Very true. Football picks back Good up job. in August. So yeah, there's not much time to really capitalize on that, that gap. But as baseball loses footing amongst the American population, even even with basketball going into June and with professional lacrosse in, in the summer, like there, 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 there's a demand there amongst people who would normally play baseball that will, I think, slowly go either to lacrosse or potentially to handball, as opposed sure. to trying to pick up the, the kids who don't make the high school basketball team, which I'm sure. Sure. I, you know, I, I've always said that, you know, let's not focus on trying to be the next football, basketball, baseball, or even hockey. Uh, mm -hmm. And maybe even MLS now, because it's starting to maybe make that make, make a waves into the, at least the NHL anyway, depending on your metric uh, soccer's already there, but there's, there's room for so many sports, you know, even at it. I mean, let's not focus on being the big sport. Let's focus on being than almost absolutely nothing. There's mm -hmm. there's room for for niche sports, um, and for them to get a gain a following. Got 330 million people. <laughs> you know, there's there. I can't be the only one that loves this game and is passionate about it. It's just a matter of exposing more people to it yep. and giving them that opportunity. Would you rather see handball become an MLS where not knocking the MLS? even though I hate the MLS, but like a corporate sort of Leviathan with, you know, these very like, just, uh, you know, just, just a very corporate, like not a lot of character to it, like, but big, big and people know what it is and people pay to watch and like, you know, it's, it's cool. Um, or would you rather have it be a very well-run small, like, like almost like roller derby, you know, like uh, you have to go off the beaten path. It's got a little bit of patina to it. It's, it's, gritty and like a little bit cool but it's still a functional business which world would you rather live in where there's maybe a, a few hundred thousand a couple million people following handball in the second scenario but like much more mainstream in the in the mls one well i, I guess both you know with the uh you know the niche sport you know with a uh, with respectable following and, and, and continuing to grow as as the obvious first target and then once you actually get established, then start looking at a pro league. I mean, that's basically what rugby has done. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they've they been around a long time. They kind of had some fits and starts, but always they've had that college game becoming, you know, growing, becoming more stabilized. And as they've gotten bigger and more organized, they've had guys graduate from college and become wealthy entrepreneurs. The possibility of a pro league became feasible you know it's 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 a bunch of guys that love rugby that is fueling the mlr you know and it's just a semi pro league but they have dreams of it being bigger but you know i guess baby steps don't you know i would love to see a pro league i would love for our pro league to compete with the european pro leagues that would be totally awesome i would love to go to those games I would love to go to a semi-pro type game. Um, you know, I, I think I was messaging with uh, JD. I, I went to a major uh, arena soccer league uh, match, mm -hmm. the second division. And uh, that was, I had a great time. 
you know, watching that. And I was like, oh, wow, you know, I could see handball doing something like this. It's just something that we're, it's going to take some time. Yep. You know, it's uh, I, I, I'm, I'm skeptical of the, the great leap forward, you know, boom, you know, yeah. all of a sudden show up on the scene. Know. Yeah. Yeah. Joey and I uh, are working on kind of more of that semi pro route right now with uh, some games with some audience level. Uh, we've been spending a lot of time talking with the futsal community and, you know, they'll fill a high school gym anywhere from three to 500 people. No problem. Um, and I think that that's a target that we can achieve fairly quickly, uh, with some good, you know, marketing and advertisement level to, to bring just friends and family alone. Uh, the big thing is just getting a, a quality product that people understand and, you know, people understand soccer, ball goes in net. Cool. Goal. I, I got that. Handball, there's some, some, you know, you're so much scoring. You don't know, like, oh, should I, should I cheer all the time? Uh, I'm not really sure when to cheer. Uh, this seemed like a good thing, but because people are so unfamiliar <laughs> with it, they don't, they just sit there in silence. So basically we're, we're going to need a like designated fan section that kind of leads people in the getting hyped and getting into the game. So creating that atmosphere is something that we're really uh, looking to do to the point where you know, Joey um, is retiring. I'll make that announcement. Joey is looking towards retirement. Uh, from playing for strictly entertainer purposes you know that that sounds feasible but i guess the one thing that i've um consistently thought would be better but always have always been pretty much disappointed is anytime there's been a handball event in the u.s outside of the 96 olympics Mm -hmm. maybe the 84 olympics too i wasn't there is it's tough to put butts in seats. Yep. It is really, really hard to do, even if you really know what you're doing. You know, and it, it takes a lot of marketing. Um, and the thing that futsal has and that soccer has is there's a bit of a culture now. Yep. You know, the kids have grown up playing it. They appreciate the game and they're willing to go see it. Um, and we don't have that with handball and that's that's hard to create if it doesn't exist um don't get me wrong i think a lot of people if you get them there they'll be going like hey yeah it's pretty cool beats the hell out of soccer or baseball but getting those people there that is not easy so agreed we will uh, keep brainstorming, and if we get uh, if we get the secret sauce, we'll let you know. But uh, yeah, yeah. I'll, I would love it. <laughs> you know, that would be just totally awesome. It, it's just you know, yeah. Um, it, it seems to me like it would have been done if right? it could have. Been done. Agreed. Agreed. Disagree. Ah. Disagree. Because you know what? If that's the case, then like, why are we even? Why are you even trying with handball? You know, like if that's the if that's the the case, then like, you know, sorry, handball, like just not gonna happen in the US. But I genuinely I think all three of us do genuinely believe it can happen. And it's a matter of just thinking a little differently, in my mm-hmm. opinion. I think the way to to get people to care about handball is to meet them where they're at and not try to sell them on the merits of the sport, but find out what people value and adapt the sport itself to what people are willing to pay money for, if that makes any sense. Like what my theory is with Detroit is that people with handball, they it's interchangeable. They, they, they could go to a, a minor league baseball game. They could go to a minor league soccer game, like the sport itself, you know, it is what it is. But like, if you're willing to offer them something beyond just handball, something to the effect of like you're you're getting in on the ground floor of this like underground sort of like cult sport niche sport like there, there's a, an appeal to that they're 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 gonna buy into that as opposed to like handball your favorite mm-hmm. sport you've never heard of well, they got, you know well, that you know I, I i look at myself going to that indoor soccer game and then a usl soccer game here in colorado springs i hate soccer i do not like it I'll watch it during the World Cup just because of the spectacle of it all. Um, but I'm a sports fan, 
And, and out of curiosity, I've gone to one of those. I've paid to go to a soccer game three times in my life. You know, one of those was uh, Paris Saint Germain. In uh, oh, that's a pretty good game <laughs> you know, to go watch. It was something to see. I'm, I'm glad I did. Um, but you know, you you can get a guy like me, a sports fan, and you can get him to go out there. And, and you you can't rely a hundred percent on the on the diehard soccer fans or the diehard handball fans or the diehard football fans. You need to have kind of an event to to grab guys like me that mm-hmm. maybe aren't so inclined. But it's tough to start if you don't have you know a, a diehard group that you can count on. Amen. I guess that's what I'm getting at. We don't have that diehard group to work with right now. And wow, it's your genius. If you can <laughs> get a bunch of people who don't even know what it is to, to go to it, it it's I, fire. Fest. That's the one thing. <laughs> yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll see what we can do to, to sway some people here. But I know for me, like having stuff in Columbus, I have a pretty easy situation because I can just basically force all of the Ohio state guys to go to any of the Armada games. If that ends up being the case. So most of the time we play them on campus. So they're already close by. They don't have to drive anywhere. So I, I kind of have them pigeonholed. But, but those are the guys I'm talking about. Those, they may not seem like die hard, but if they're practicing the sport, they've already, you know, gotten a, a, a level of love for the game right. that it's not twisting their arm to go do something that they've never seen before. Right. Right. And that's a that's a starting point, and then you can have those guys bring a friend, et cetera, Bingo. et cetera. Yep, exactly, exactly. And I mean, beyond people who play the sport actively, and even within people who play a sport actively, how many people in the United States of America can name a single professional handball team? Well, I, that's I, I venture to say a that's a European problem, and, yeah. and that's something I've always. Anytime I've talked to a European, I've said like, you know there's so few people handball people in the U S and even those few people have zero yeah. understanding of certainly they have zero understanding of the pro club game and even just a, a rough understanding of the national team who's good and why and who the good players are. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, that's their problem. All right. If you've got a, if you got a product like that and you can't even get the few people that care about handball in the United States to know better, mm-hmm. that's a problem. You know, uh, my, my favorite example of that is back at the strategic planning session that we had in Salt Lake in 2012, there was a champions league game that was going on and I put it on my computer and I was watching it. And a fairly well-known handball person in the U.S. saw Mikhail Hansen, and they said, who is that? Oh my like, Lord. That guy looks like Thor. Now, Grant Hansen wasn't quite as well-known back then, but, but he was still still one of the top 10 players in the world. Yeah. And, Love it. and to me, I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> Uh, that's a problem mm-hmm. if you can't I, I mean why we suck at handball yep. i wonder why we don't even know who the best player in the world is. that's when i took the ohio state guys to denmark last year you know we're riding in the car to go meet peter bredsdorf larsen who was the uh, uh, assistant coach for the danish national team at one time and uh you know we were talking about some danish players and a couple guys in the car were like you know who's the who's the best handball player and i was like michael hansen and they're like oh who, who is he who does he play for i'm like look we're in denmark he's probably one of the best danish players to ever play the game like just don't ask that question like just keep that quiet we're gonna keep that in the car you didn't you didn't say that out loud and it's uh, it's like the beautiful girl from new jersey just don't open your mouth just <laughs> just look pretty yep don't just, say anything yep, exactly. and then people are gonna Smile go like wave. oh my god <laughs> exactly yep so oh man oh man oh well i think we're approaching our commercial break here. oh yes we got one minute for our commercial break so i think this is a good time to uh 
take a pause and uh john we're going to ask you to rejoin the zoom because uh we right. only get 40 minutes I need, time. To, I need to get another uh voodoo another. ranger oh today's podcast, podcast brought, brought to you by voodoo you by ranger <laughs> from new belgian brewery in fort collins colorado there you have it folks grab yourself a voodoo ranger <laughs> all right we'll be back in uh 30 seconds or less hopefully all right stay tuned folks Well, folks, thanks for uh, listening so far. We got uh, an excellent conversation going on with John Ryan. John, uh, lots of handball knowledge, uh, well traveled as well. He's done a lot of covering a lot of the U.S. events over the last, oh, I don't know, almost 20 years. Uh, he self funds a lot of his trips out to college nationals and open nationals he's a, a true selfless individual when it comes to handball he's just looking to help um so if you guys have any questions about the state of handball in the united states john's an excellent uh source of knowledge and if you just want to check out his website team handball news you probably can find anything handball related on there so um we're going to give them a couple more moments till we can uh, get him back in the chat while he grabs another Voodoo Ranger. Voodoo Ranger, the official uh, beer of Fort Collins, Colorado. Uh, I don't know what their official tagline is, but I'm sure we'll catch some flack on that. Um, YouTube will get at me on the copyright infringements. But hey, if YouTube's caring, that means uh, Handball's making some progress, isn't it? I know I got Joey back on... Uh, on the chat here we're just waiting for john to get back um uh, you know if you got any questions feel free to throw them in the twitch chat i know we're joined today by our good friends cj and alex uh they played at uh, ohio state as well as back in malaysia so um cj is currently playing with the team out in seattle and uh what did i say did i not say i was on twitch uh, i don't know they're telling me I'm saying the wrong things now. He got me all flustered. Anyways, Alex is uh, studying, getting his master's at, at Syracuse, I believe. So he's kind of isolated up there when it comes to handball. So um, he tends to kind of pick up with the Armada from, ten to from time to time. So we'd love to get him back in the game. Uh, but John is joining the conversation here. So we will transition back once I get John back on the call here. Perfect. Let me do a quick little screen editing and then we will be good to go, folks. Do, 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 do. Hope everybody's having a fantastic weekend. Uh, had some interesting weather here in Ohio, trying to dodge the uh, Saharan uh, sandstorms. So it's a, you know, 2020 is truly a year of many, many crazy things. So. Uh, I, I just don't know what's next. I mean, I asked some of my coworkers and they said, I've never heard of a Saharan sandstorm, but I've talked to a couple people that claim that it happens every year. And I'm like, I feel like I would hurt here about this. <laughs> so, um, anyways, we're back folks. Sorry for my rambling. Um, we were just, uh, talking about, uh, whole bunch of stuff with john about the uh, state of handball in america as well as you know maybe some pathways to help grow the game uh the struggles that we often face starting a new team as well as our sponsor for today's episode voodoo ranger so everybody if you're in the colorado uh region out west grab yourself a nice voodoo ranger so joey you want to pick up where we michigan. you can get a michigan Oh. I'm pretty sure you can probably get them in Ohio too. I've I have not seen a Voodoo Ranger on the shelf. They're, they're the same guys that make fat tire. Okay. Oh, okay. You said New Belgium. You did. Okay. Yeah. I bet you can get that in a lot of different places. So cool, 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 cool. Um, Joey, I, I know you, I didn't want to cut you off there. I feel like you were rolling. So oh, you're good. I can't even remember what I was saying. But let's let's transition a little bit. Talking about New Belgium. Talking about craft beer. That's uh. It's it's a weird you, you don't think you know handball craft beer there there could be any crossover but let's talk about it because that's a phenomenon in the past twenty years that you know who would have thought who would have thought in, in West Michigan um, there was nothing like there was Bell's down in Kalamazoo 
uh, back in the nineties. And then uh, all of a sudden these, these people start starting up uh, craft breweries. And then for about 15 to 20 years there, like it wasn't a thing, like nobody, nobody knew. And now all of a sudden it's, it's become sort of a cult phenomenon where everyone's starting a brewery, right. Yeah. In every town who would have thought 20 years ago, that would have been the case. And it's more, more than just a, a business, more than just a product. It's there's a culture around it that, that has become very interesting. So John, how can we make team handball more like craft beer? Um, Put you on I think spot. you need to, I think you need to focus on one aspect and maybe geography in one area. I remember when craft beer started to become cool and it was in Colorado was a big part of it back in the, uh, 1990s, you know, the fact, uh, Hickenlooper, the guy running for uh, Senate in Colorado was one of the first, uh, brew pub owners in uh, Lodo right down there by the new course field. It was kind of a thing that started, I'm sure there were some other states that were also involved, but it, it kind of evolved from there and, and, and grew a greater uh, following. Mm -hmm. But it didn't start everywhere all at once. It started in one place and people were like, oh, wow, well, I don't have to drink just Budweiser and yeah. Miller. <laughs> you know, there are, um, there it, it's something that gradually, uh, as people figured it out, if you will. Um, so I think, I think, Focusing on some geography areas, um, I'm, I'm a big proponent on focusing on college handball and, you know, trying to concentrate resources all in one area and making it something there, um, I think is a, is a good strategy to follow. I think if you try and do everything at once with limited resources, you'll spread yourself too thin. Um, so I agree with that. That's what I would focus on. So Joey, I would say Detroit, find a college there, turn that college into powerhouse. There we go. You heard Again, him, Joey. You know, I'm going to push back, John. <laughs> I think there beyond, and I, I do agree though, the college game, you're right. We need people to focus on that. And that's, that's part of the reason I, I like JD. One of many reasons I like JD so much is like, he is an advocate for the college game. And I think, it doesn't matter whether you're playing um, squash or, you know, cornhole or Quidditch. If the University of Michigan plays Ohio State and anything, people, people are going to care. care. People are going to watch. Yep. Uh, it's just a matter. I'm not sure if you knew about this, but some dude tried to start something at U of M. I'm not sure how, like, obviously he didn't succeed, it's but I'm not sure how uh, with faith he tried. But uh, it was actually back around the time I was getting started. This is a tangent. Um, I emailed this dude cause he wanted to start something at U of M and like never responded, whatever, moved on with my life. Talked to JD over the years. The guy like never connected. They with had JD. a website and uh, we connected. They, they had a website. They had, uh, he said well, they, they had a full played. team and I offered like, Hey, we'll come up to Michigan. He said, no. I said, Hey, you can come down here. He said, no. And then I just kept emailing him and, uh, all just crickets from then on. So and I'm here's what sure. makes that story painful. We recently got in touch with the gentleman in Flint who wants to start a team. And he was telling us that back in the day, he got in touch with um, Mary Ashush, Mariusz. whatever his name was. Yeah. Mariusz. Mariusz. <laughs> uh, from USA Team Handball. And Mariusz sent this guy in Flint goals, balls, all this stuff. And he worked hard. He wasn't able to get anything going. But then he, <laughs> USA Team Handball told this guy, hey, send all that equipment to the University of Michigan and they'll build – you know, just put it to better use than you. So he did that. And here we are today um, with all that stuff missing and whatever this U of M guy's name was. Alex so, Bennett. Yeah. Yep. You know, uh, but this all is... this to say, yes, college is important, but I think there's an opportunity for people in certain cities to, to start a fully, you know, vertical organization uh, for a handball in, in a way similar to, to crack brewing. In, in sort of a weird way i just think there's an opportunity there to, to if you develop youth and if you develop an adult team where the adult team right now there's nothing in the youth for the national stage but it's very easy to have a local youth handball league that's super easy in my opinion tweet at me if you have a problem with that 
you also for the adult side it's easy for me to to have a Detroit team play against Columbus or play against Pittsburgh or play against Chicago and so when you have this combination of youth players just playing the game for fun at a recreational level and they and their parents see that oh so Detroit has the team and they're playing against Chicago there's some added credibility there and if you're able to figure out the infrastructure which I have not and I don't know of anybody who has um, you can I feel like you can make that into a viable business and scale that to different cities huge rant I'm sorry about that you know it's there's a lot of things that can be done you know I, I but I, I think I think if they don't pick one focus area you're you're, you're kind of spread too thin mm-hmm. and you know it's not to say hey don't do a youth team don't start an adult team but you know if you've got limited resources you know pick an area that you really want to turn into something i think the college is the one that is the most feasible right now you know it's 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 tough to try and do everything at once you don't want to be negative about hey no well screw you i'm not going to help you um, but you can be selective on how you target your resources and how you steer people towards doing something. You know, pick pick one area and kick ass in that one area. I think that's a smart way to get the ball rolling. Um, uh, that's that's to me is what should be done. But we can. <laughs> We, we've been having this debate for yeah. decades now. Not Maybe not you guys, but I have. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I know for me, the college situation, like, uh, it's tough, but it has it's, it has a lot of benefits. I mean, for me, uh, one of the things, uh, if you go to Ohio State, even if you're not from Columbus, because Columbus is a pretty, you know, growing and thriving city, a lot of the kids that graduate, they stay in Columbus. And as a result, I just have those kids basically held hostage to continue playing handball for me. Um, I know that's not the case, obviously, with places like Penn State. You know, nobody's looking to stay in State College, Pennsylvania. Uh, even Pittsburgh, I know big big issues there. Nobody wants to stick around at Pittsburgh. So um, it's I'm fortunate, but uh, we also have a lot of other benefits. You know, having a college team is a lot of times you can get the, the gyms for discounted rates, if not free. Um, so the college team can have – the adult team in the area come in and play a game for free. And that's, you know, I hear a lot of complaints from the other adult clubs that, Oh, well, gym fees are too high. I can't afford it. Well, you know, if you get a college team might be able to help uh, reduce some of your costs there. So uh, not to mention a player pipeline. It, it's one of those things that guys age out. And if you just keep bringing in young guys and get them, you know, acclimated with the adult clubs in the area, you, you're continuing to grow handball. I mean, I, I, I'm sure just from my time with Ohio State, I've probably had hundreds of kids that have come through our program that will never play handball ever again. And that's that's just the reality of uh, the situation. And we got to continue to just keep those uh, numbers growing on the continue to play versus the stop playing side. So, yeah, you know, the, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, um, it, it, you may not create future players for an adult team. You may not create uh, future national team players, but in theory, you're creating lifelong fans. Right. Right. That, that can love the game. You know, maybe you get a program in and if you keep it going for year after year, you can have like an alumni weekend. Yeah. Everybody comes back to watch the big Michigan, Ohio state game. And, uh, and yeah. alumni bring yeah. money too, so that's also uh, exactly. It's also, a plus. Yeah, and that's and that, we we talked a little bit about that with uh, Cuban. You know, he played mm-hmm. rugby in college, yep. and he's quietly given some money to some to some rugby programs. But there are a lot of little Cubans. Yeah. They may not be billionaires, but they are multimillionaires, mm-hmm. and they they remember their college experience and and what it did for them, and they contribute. Um, to those college programs and keep them, keep them uh, running afloat. Yeah. Um, and you get that sense of camaraderie and it continues. Maybe these people are now fans that 
are going to go to this pro league that you're starting up. They're going to bring their family and, and, and participate. Maybe they're going to, um, like lacrosse has, has done, they're going to start youth lacrosse programs in their area that are then going to feed into, into these yeah. different programs. Yeah. So, um, you know, there's more, there's more than the goal of continuing people to go on from college, which would be nice, yeah. but that's not always going to be the case. Necessary. Yeah. John, I got a question. So right now, the way college handball grows is you get one crazy dude or, uh, or T- woman. Typically who, a, a lacrosse goalie. <laughs> yeah. which <laughs> Or a goalie of some sport, at least. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there's a, there's a little, uh, yeah. There's a, there's a study there at some point. Me and JD were both lacrosse <laughs> goalies. So we're, we're trying, oh, and Mike King as well. Um, yeah. Basically, though, it's it's you get one guy who's – season in the Olympics, loves it, is going to go to the Olympics for it, is on fire about it, and tells all his frat buddies, like, hey, we're going to go play the tournament at Ohio State. And that's how club teams are currently started. And JD, Ohio State and West, the academies, are the exception to that because they've been able to keep the teams running beyond, you know. Don't forget North Carolina. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, don't, Carolina, yeah. They'll, they'll, they'll beat you up there, Joey. Yeah, sorry about that. Um how do we start a new college team? If, uh, let's say, let's start one where no, there's no affiliation with anyone. You don't have any friends who, who are alumni of there. How do we get a college handball team at like the University of Wisconsin? How would you approach that, John? Well, I think I like the idea of picking some select areas, kind of like what USA Team Handball has done with the ambassadors. You have somebody there to provide support. Um, but I'm, I'm not so sure whether you can go from scratch. To me, that's challenging. Mm-hmm. I think you want to be uh, uh, able to move where the opportunity strikes. You know, So if you've got a new JD that wants to start a program up at I don't know uh, Indiana. UNLV. Okay, UNLV. That you right. can that you can provide the support for them to get going. You can assess. Well, is this like the no name guy from Michigan? He's just a yeah. fly by night guy that's not going to go anywhere. Mm-hmm. Or you, you talk to this guy and you say, "Well, oh, no, this guy seems to have his act together," mm-hmm. and you provide that person with the support and resources to get things going. Now, ideally, you also maybe you partner them with a sister university and, you know, somebody nearby. Like I would tell North Carolina, if we want to talk North Carolina, I've told these guys many times. You know, Where's Duke? Come on. <laughs> well, maybe not Duke because, okay. you know, private school yeah, may be fair, a little more fair. challenging, but North Carolina state, what the hell is going on? Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, and I've talked to miles a little bit. He said, we've gone there. We've talked to people, you know? So, it's not easy to start a new program, but you keep, you keep plugging away and you look for those opportunities um, and you're ready to strike. So like, uh, you know, we didn't get the Olympics this summer, but you know, hopefully we get them next summer and you are, you are, you know, spring loaded to strike. What does that when the, like? you know, describe being spring loaded? You have the equipment, the balls, and the resources ready to go to them. Maybe even, you know, fly somebody there to help out. You know, it's kind of, you, you got to kind of gauge, is this guy just blowing smoke or is this guy really motivated? You got to kind of talk to the guy to really, you know, decide whether this is a super motivated person or is this some guy that's, are you sending goals that are going to sit in the, North Carolina State, you know, PE recreational area can be used for futsal or something. So it's kind of complicated. It's not easy. You know, it's a combination of um, uh, being ready, you know, and another thing, you know, for being ready to strike, ramble in a little bit, but have have a tryout set up. You know, you can call it a national team tryout, but have something where you have something organized yeah, to, to get it. people's names and numbers 
Um, and, and, and maybe it's not a national team trial. It's just like, hey, we want to show you what team handball is. Mm-hmm. And you get some people to show up. Maybe you've identified some high school kids that maybe they're not division one or some college kids that are, um, you know, playing club basketball. I think I've told you the story. I have, a, I have a nephew, six foot seven, you know, guy that played club basketball at Iowa state for four years and, and he had fun, you know, they went mm-hmm. on trips and stuff. It was kind yeah. of like a handball club, yeah, yeah. but shoot, why not have a handball club? Maybe he'd be, he'd yeah. be the next Luke Bolt, yeah. you know, or, or something. Um, and, and you, you need to have something spring loaded to really strike because that's a narrow window of opportunity where you have to really grab their attention and, and try and make it something that's not fly by night, that, but that's something that is sustainable. Yeah. That's where I get a little disappointed with the ambassadors situation because a, I uh, helped create, I'd say those positions, um, but they didn't pan out exactly how I had envision them to be uh, i know a lot of conversations have been focused on youth and grassroots and that's not what the intent was for is for college efforts and i think that if you were to have you know those individuals in their regions target certain schools and at welcome week and uh, involvement fairs they basically set up a table just like any other club you know make it seem like a club exists there so that you you know you take another guy with you you're all wearing the team usa stuff you know maybe take drew donlin or somebody like that and just have them basically travel around with you for the week you hold sure uh, si- have people sign up the next day or later that night you have like a little mini scrimmage um get people playing the game find somebody who wants to be a leader and then you hand it off and you go to the next school the next day and there's definitely a possibility if you look at the timeline as far as when those involvement fair dates they, there's there's not really that much overlap so like you could absolutely hit say in in my region in the mac you know you could hit a toledo bowling green kent uh kent state uh ou um akron all in a week no problem um and it'd be low budget uh, operation as well for two or three individuals and i think that that would make a huge difference um and the thing is that those schools they got huge numbers i mean you're talking anywhere from 10 to 25,000 and at a at a mac school um, I'm not trying to brag that Ohio's got a lot of good sized uh, colleges, but if I'm trying to go after some D3 schools in New York, I don't, I'm just, it's just not, the numbers aren't there. And most of those kids are already athletes on team. So, um, and then to your, you know, example, John with UNLV, if I try to do something out there, well, the budget situation comes into play because they got Air Force and that's still going to have to be a, a flight or an extremely long drive to, sure. to play Air Force. So it's it's tough. It's very tough. But that's just my if were, rant. If only there was a national team assistant coach and USA Team Handball board member living in Columbus, Ohio. <laughs> yeah. That would be good. Yeah, that would, that would help, I'm sure. Well, you know, I mean, that, that's that would be a college director. Right. You know, right. somebody, somebody takes ownership in college. He's not doing youth. He's not doing our U19 team. That's mostly dual citizens that are already being developed. Anyway, he is laser focused on college development. He gets called to the office. If Illinois state's program folds to explain why it's folded and how he let that happen. He he's accountable for how many college teams there are in the U.S. and why they aren't being sustained. Yeah, and he gets credit when he like creates these new programs out of nowhere. But that is his job, and he's accountable for it. If you ha- if you're doing ten different things, if you're doing clinics in your local area, um, if you're helping to feed the U21 team, U19 team with athletes. If you're doing all those sorts of things, you're not laser focused. You're, you're the little Dutch boy, you're Mike Cavanaugh, you know, all by himself trying to, you know, plug the holes, plug the holes in, you know, wherever they are in the dike. (laughs) Yeah. I'm just imagining Mike Cavanaugh in wooden shoes and a little Dutch boy. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> oh man oh, that's too good but yeah it's interesting because uh like today um i talked with aaron ham and will kennedy and we were discussing the you know pathway of a potential college all-star team program where you you take one to three players from each uh collegiate team and you'd have two training sessions uh two week-long training camps uh throughout the year and then that that team would basically like compete as a unit at uh, non-collegiate specific tournaments so like you know your blue cups your michael lipovs and that way they could go and compete at elite um and not conflict with college nationals and so uh i love that idea yeah they, and, they, and they i would did even, a really I would good even send them to europe yeah you know usa rugby has a has had a college all American team where they've uh, you know traveled to Europe and played some games. Not not to say I don't love our dual citizens and what they do, um, but I think if you're really going to go grow the college game, you're going to give an opportunity for those guys to something that they can um, reach drive. for yeah, exactly. on the national team. Yep. There, there needs to be something between the national team and the college game, and right now it doesn't really exist. Completely agree. The, the continental United States, for, for that matter. Yeah. As yeah. much as, again, I love the dual citizens and I'm friends with many of them. Like, yeah. let's let's use this to transition into uh, one of the topics that we yes. wanted to discuss a little bit, which was forum forum club handball. John, what is it? Because I honestly don't fully understand, and why is it important for handball in the U.S. All right, um, I thought a little bit about this, and I've explained it to some other people this way. And you have to remember how pro sports are just significantly different in Europe and how they are structured. Um, and, and what I like to look at is what is the relationship between USA basketball and the NBA? Uh, there's, there's not a whole lot of continuity. There are two, two separate uh, programs, I'd say. Well, it, and, and if you're talking about national teams or anything, who calls the shots? Well, uh, whoever the coach is, like, which is usually well, like. Say, I, I can name Adam Silver, but I can't name the CEO of USA Basketball. Yeah, right. it's the right. NBA. The yeah. NBA is king. You know, USA Basketball is a few guys, that, you know, have a nice office down town, Colorado Springs. Not, not to say that they don't have a job to do, but they don't call the shots. It's, it's night and day, um, you know, as far as where the power lies. In Europe, that's not how things work. And the, the, the European federations and the national federations have a lot of say in all the sports in how things are run. UEFA is huge. Um, how important is FIBA America in terms of the NBA? <laughs> Irrelevant. <laughs> Irrelevant. And so that that whole structure just it's it's just kind of funny if you look at it from an American context and then you go into a European context, it's a whole nother ball game. And who pays the salaries for athletes in the NBA? The NBA. Uh, the NBA, yeah. <laughs> The clubs. Right, yeah. Who pays the salaries and, and how do all the best handball players in the world make their money in Europe? I, I, I honestly couldn't tell you. I know some of them got shoe the deals. The clubs. But, okay. The clubs pay the salaries. They pay almost everything. I mean, I think there's some stipends when they go to the European championships or and, and that's Wait. changed. The financial situation has changed a little bit. Wait, you mean Paris Saint Germain can afford to pay their players? No. And way. they pay them when they go, you know, for a long time. And the way it worked, they were essentially paying for them to go to the European Championships or the World Championships. Now, you you might remember Mike Cu Mark Cuban making some noise about you know, his Europe, his uh, European based players wanted to play for their national teams and some arm twisting going on about whether they would play Popovich has done that with San Antonio. Um, kind of like said, Hey, you know, what are you doing this summer? <laughs> Why are you playing all those games? Mm -hmm. 
imagine imagine if the NBA shut down in January for a whole month for international break for everybody oh, to go yeah. play international sports. Jeez. Can you can you even conceive of that? Not possible. No way. It's it's ridiculous from an American context. I, I just can't even believe it's done. Mm-hmm. But but that goes to how European sports are organized and and how the national teams across the board really mean something over there. Whereas in the US national teams, other than soccer and Olympic competition, our national teams are meaningless. Mm-hmm. Uh, do I get a I get a head nod on that, yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's not the case in Europe. And if you look at handball, the biggest events every year is either the men's European Championships or the men's World Championships. Yep. Those are the marquee events. So, um, and you'll you'll get some comments sometimes from uh, Euros based in the U.S. is like like the World Basketball Championships are going on is like, why isn't this on TV? Why does no one here care? <laughs> Because the NBA is on. <laughs> the NBA, the NBA is a superior product. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the best of seven series for an NBA, which is hotly contested. I w- I would rather watch that any day of the week than the World Basketball Championships, yep. even the Olympics. Yeah. yeah. So, so take that into context and take out like these clubs are paying the salaries and. The European Handball Federation is taking all the money, and the national federations are taking all the money. Your your my players are going to go get injured in these competitions, and then they're going to come back for Champions League games. So you take that all into context, and you're going like, this doesn't make any sense. And that's a bit where the Forum Club Handball has come into play, and they basically copied what soccer has and i think basketball does it several european sports have said the top clubs have gotten together and said hey we're getting steamrolled here we need to stick up for our own rights and that's what the forum club handball essentially has done is it's 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 a loose confederation of these clubs and represents those clubs interests in regards to european competition and world competitions and so they have been able to get more money uh, being paid as insurance, if you will. Mm-hmm. You know, the Cubs are, clubs are compensated now for, for that competition uh, when, when everybody's leaving. Um, when the uh, new contract rolls in here in a couple of days for European handball, the, the Forum Club handball was part of the discussions for that new contract. And uh, the clubs are getting more money uh, as, as part of that new contract. The um, it's not all just rolling into the European Handball Federation offices in Austria. A lot of that is being distributed to the the clubs, and is money that they can use. And they have a seat at the table now to say, "Hey, why aren't we?" Uh, investing more in uh, handball and markets like the U.S. and, and China. Uh, so they have a seat at the table, and it gives them an opportunity to advocate for club interests, which in a lot of cases are maybe the interests of the European Handball Federation and even the IHF as well. Interesting. Man, like I just uh, – I'm trying to – Joey, we lost him on the call there, so I'm trying to put him back in the rights. Yeah, I'm just just trying to wrap my head around like, and the thing is, is John, when you try to explain that to a, a U.S. based person, it just they'll never, it just never will add up, and then that's where uh, I lose a lot of people's attention trying to get that, you know, conversation. Well, that's that's, that's why I went on the diatribe comparing the U.S. and Europe and how things mm-hmm. are organized. And you know, the other part of that is. We're one country, <laughs> you know, that makes yeah. things relatively, uh, sorry, Canadians, I guess, <laughs> you know, you guys also have a couple teams that we throw in and even that lo- adds a layer of complex, complex, complexion, uh, mm-hmm. complexity, complexity, complexity to uh, some of the things going with COVID. 
yeah. you know, right now, the, the Canadian hockey teams and the Canadian baseball teams are just traveling to the U.S. Imagine if the U.S. was broken up into 25 different countries. Each state and, was and their each, own entity or something like that, basically. Yeah, and, and they had their own pro leagues. Yeah. And, and the closest analogy I get, I get to that is um, NCAA basketball. If you look at like uh, all the different conferences and the good conferences, the bad conferences, you got the power five, you know, they have good programs. And then you, let's say that there wasn't an NCAA kind of wrapping all that around. And then you had, you had each of those conferences deciding about a competition. Let's say they're going to call it the champions league of NCAA basketball. Mm -hmm. And, and they said like, well, we'll play games. We'll have our conference games and then we'll have our champions league games that we'll play during the season. And then at the end of the season, we'll have like a round of 16 with the top teams and we'll all play each other. And, um, and you had to decide how you're going to decide which of those 16 teams are going to get in from all, you know, yeah. who, who's going to get in from the Pac-10 and the Big Ten and the SEC. Mm -hmm. What if there's a really good team in the MAC? Just coming or, out of nowhere. Yeah. Or a Gonzaga in the yeah. – whatever that conference is. Mount, the Mountain West. West. Yeah. Yeah. So you have all those different entities with all their different uh, – um, uh, agendas because mm -hmm. you you got the german league which has maybe five or six teams that probably could be in the champions league no problem mm -hmm. and then you have uh barcelona which is in the spanish league and then they're like head and shoulders above everybody else so they're kind of like maybe gonzaga in the west coast conference yep um so that's why i talk about the forum club handball as being a loose confederation because all those clubs have different situations. The German clubs have a huge competition where everything is, uh, every match they play is a big battle. Whereas Barcelona, they only have two or three games where they break a sweat yeah. every year in their league. And, and the same thing with, uh, um, with the Hungarian teams, the Macedonia, Macedonian teams yeah. um, to a certain extent. And you've got to you've got to you take all those interests and get everybody on the same page. It's pretty tough to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd imagine that's why everybody hates the NCAA. <laughs> it doesn't sound like people hate FCH. Uh, from what little I know about it, I don't get the yeah. may, maybe I'm off base, but I'm not. The European Handball Federation wasn't a big fan of them when okay. they started. They've kind of warmed up to it, and um, you know, at, at one time there was even talk. Um, it was very interesting, you know, Beanie had a interview with, uh, Chavi O'Callaghan mm -hmm. and it's like, everybody's all, you know, on the same page and everything eh, for a while there. Some of the top clubs are like going, we're going to just form our own league. And mm -hmm. that's what happened in basketball. Oh, basketball boy. said, we're, we're done with, uh, the FIBA Europe. We're going to do our own thing. And it's separate from the international federation or from the European Federation. And for a while there, the European Handball Federation was a little worried that that would happen. But everything came together, and they all got on the same page. And that's why we have this contract that, you know, the EHF is working with Forum Club Handball. Um, and it's one big happy family to get the best for everybody. But yeah. there was a little bit of... Uh, Bumps in the road. Right. Yeah. yeah, there was a... It didn't just happen without a little bit of a veiled threat to say, yeah. hey, we might just have to go on our own. Man, interesting. Um, we only got three minutes left here, so we might try to either uh, rapid fire, answer some questions, or uh, start our Zoom up again. Joey, I know you were uh, trying to get – I'm sure we don't want to eat up all of John's evening, and I know, Joey, you had some things you needed to do. So if you yeah, got... I can honestly sit here and listen to you talk yeah. about that. Like, <laughs> yeah, cool, going, yeah we, could, we could head it up again. I don't want to take up your whole evening, John. You know, as much as I love talking about yeah. handball, I think I made it better rejoin my family. That's probably, this time. probably for the best. Um, yeah. Do you got any closing uh, remarks here while we, while we shut things down? Uh no, cool. uh, I tell you what, I like what you guys are doing. It's a, it's a different uh, 
format than what I do. So it's, it's nice to listen to other folks chat and uh, it was great to come on. Anytime you guys want me to pontificate on something and challenge me. I like yeah. being challenged. I like taking the challenge and then just, you know, mic dropping it, <laughs> you know? Yep. So yep. I can't wait for you to do one of those, one of these days, one of those mic drops. I'm still yeah. waiting. <laughs> no. Did I'd... you have a question I couldn't answer? I don't think so. <laughs> oh, we don't have time. We don't have Anybody time. have a question that I can't answer? Come on, no, bring I, it on. Not that, not that for me. Peanut gallery is quiet. I thought uh, I had you with the craft beer one. So oh, well. he's always got something up his sleeve. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, that was one of my other topics I wanted to talk about was the other podcast. We saw you uh, go on Benny's podcast and then uh, you've been kind of tapping in, <laughs> tapping into your own business. So it's good to see some other podcasts coming into the handball, American handball market. So getting more people talking about it is always a good thing. I agree. Different perspectives. I think Joey and I come from a little bit different uh, background than most. Um, so we'll see. Uh, it's always everybody gets their own little piece of the news our news probably isn't the most accurate but it's uh hopefully it's entertaining sometimes i can always come on and educate correct hey, whatever you want to call it we will have you on for sure then you, i know you're going to call <laughs> us out when we say something off base you and martin below he's he's always on us so awesome thank you john you yes. are awesome all right yeah perfect thank you, thanks for for tuning in today everybody and uh, as always keep shooting shooters We'll see you later. All right. Thanks, Thanks John. John. It. Tell your family thank you for letting us borrow you. I guess. Please do. And enjoy another uh, another fantastic beer there. <laughs> see ya. All right. Bye see ya. Guys. Everybody go check out uh, Team Handball News for more updates from John Ryan, as well as the rest of the uh, efforts and Actions taking place with handball across the globe and specifically here in the U.S. Uh, once again, thanks everybody for tuning in tonight's show. Have a great weekend.